Hi everyone, welcome to Life Edge, because life just doesn't have to be mediocre. I'm joined today by my good friend, Dr. Susan Nash. Hey Susan, how are you today? Great, it's a great day and we have a great guest. Yeah, and you also told us that, what is it, is it today or tomorrow? It's the uh, Year of the Dog. Yes, tomorrow is Chinese New Year, Year of the Dog. Glad to see that. It's and always you, good for all of our furry friends. And and you are a in the Chinese calendar a dog. I am a dog. Yes, That's I haven't decided which breed. Which I think breed? maybe a corgi. A corgi. <laughs> a corgi. Hmm. Well, Queen Elizabeth's favorite dog, and you know her first corgi's name was Susan, and Susan got hmm. in trouble because she bit one of the beef eaters. Oh. Hmm. But she wasn't disciplined because the corgis are special. Special. Interesting. Well, well. Okay, here we go. Let's run our intro and get going. We have a great guest today. And we are back. Susan, would you love to introduce our guest? I would. Our guest today is Bob Dahlstrom, and he's CEO and founder of Apelix. And Apelix is a unique company that, on the face of it, has drones, but actually they are robots. And so Bob will tell us all about what they do and what makes them innovative. Welcome, Bob. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So tell us about Apelix. Well, it, it's really interesting that you started by saying that they're uh, robots instead of um, drones. And it's one of those things that si kind of seems counterintuitive when you think about it, because drones are made to fly far and fly fast and take pictures. And what we've done is we've kind of set that model on its head and made them fly slow and fly close to structures and actually even touch structures and do things to them. So um, it's kind of counterintuitive to have aircraft flying close to structures, let alone touching structures and modifying them. Now, how did you come up? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Now, how did you come up with that idea? I think it's absolutely novel. When I first heard what you were doing, I, I'm always thrilled by hearing what people do with drones or with flying aircraft and, and the new uses we're finding for them, but how did you come up with that? It, it is. So I think a lot of it comes from my background in software. And so to me, I see drones as flying computers. And if you're a flying computer, you could be controlled by software. So the idea is that um, rather than climbing up a structure to coat it or paint it or um, modify it in some way to send a robotic system up there, and one of the first thoughts I had was, well, that's not really practical because if you're painting, for example, um, paint is very heavy and the battery life of a drone is very limited. Um, so that's when I came up with the idea of the umbilical cord. And I said, well, if you put the paint on the ground, you pump it up to the drone, you have the power on the ground, you power the drone. Um, at that point, you've got an aerial robotic system that with software and the right sensors can do pretty much anything you want. I believe it. So the sensors gauge, I imagine, proximity to the ship, as well as, of course, all the altitude sensors and everything else. Is it controlled by software on the ground? Oh, it's, it's absolutely controlled by software on the drone with a combination mm -hmm. of software on the ground. Okay. And what happens is when you're flying a robotic system or drone or aircraft around a large structure, you can say goodbye to the GPS because it's not going to work because you're behind the structure and you, you can't get a GPS signal. You can say goodbye sure. to the magnetic compass for directional purposes because the large ship, for example, creates its own magnetic field. You can say goodbye to the altitude control from barometric pressure because when you're mm -hmm. flying next to a structure, the barometric pressure changes. So we had to overcome all of those um, limitations and it's all done with software and sensors. Are you, are you using transponders? No, so what we're using is a blend of a lot of different technologies. So what happens if certain technologies work well close to a structure, certain, work, certain technologies work well far away from a structure, 
um, when you get to difficult use cases, for example, a building with glass in it, mm. um, then then you have very complex um, situations. I mean, a bird will crash into glass sometimes. Oh yeah, and that's that's a, an intelligent animal that has a lot more if you want to call it processing or or information uh, available to it than than computers do so being able to have the right sensor array and the right blend of technologies to gather the right data to then control the aircraft's movement or the robotic systems movement is absolutely critical that's interesting well i have a question as well so when you say that you have an umbilical cord now that's basically like a hose that that and and the what goes through that is the paint or material that you're spraying yeah so we have different products that do different things um the one that does the spray painting there's an umbilical cord and we call it that because it's not just a wire so we have the electrical system pumping the you know the the uh the voltage up the wire but then you also need a tube that has the fluid transfer or the material transfer component to it. And so the umbilical cord sort of wraps those two together so that you have both the power and the material that you're transferring up to the structure. So, so you mentioned something about battery life. How long um, does your battery last and how is it different than say a regular drone? Oh, well, if you're connected with an umbilical cord, you theoretically have unlimited power. So okay. we've structured our systems where they have um, 5,000 watts of power on them, which is pretty remarkable mm -hmm. to me because I'm not an electrician. But to see the system plugged into a 220 volt, you know, something that powers at your house a range or a dryer, and then have it converted down to this little tiny wire that goes up to the um, uh, to the aer aerial robotic system uh, it is pretty amazing. Well, if you if to put that into perspective, if you look at one of those old HP laser jet printers, they they consumed about fifteen hundred watts, and they weighed about fifty pounds. So you've got your drone at five thousand watts. That's that's a lot of wattage for it. That's great. How much do they weigh when when they're up there? It, it is so the the total weight of the aircraft um, is around um, twenty five pounds. That's not bad. Um, and it has <laughs> the ability to lift. We have a couple models. There's a, a, a the X four and the X eight. So there's the four rotor or the eight mo rotor. Interesting. One lifts forty pounds. <laughs> one lifts eighty pounds. Wow. Are, are you using a specific brand, or did you build your own? Well, we started out using commercial, off the shelf, um, available drone systems and then we ended up modifying them so extensively that we now just built our own but That's in good. some respects it's very similar to you know a dell computer for example mm -hmm. um dell does not make the computer they they assemble it so they buy the hard drives from a company they buy the processor from a company mm -hmm. they buy the the memory from a company the the same with us we design and send out the uh, designed for the cutting of the carbon fiber for the frame, and then we buy the electronics from one company, we buy the motors from another company, and then we add our proprietary circuit cards to that to be able to control it. We add our um, you know, sensors to it, and, and then our software, of course. So I've got to ask you, have you ever had a crash? Well, I imagine oh, in the cool. early days, but um, yeah. how, how secure and safe is it as far as uh, you know, the, the time before there's any failures in parts or anything? I imagine it could last yeah. for a very, very long time. We're getting there. We haven't had a crash in a long time, but initially we were crashing a lot. And actually, I even tell our developers, you know, if you're not crashing, you're not iterating fast enough. Yeah, I um, love it. Because one of the things we want to do in the development process is crash so that when we get to the job site where we're doing the work, we don't crash. Because every time we crash, we learn something. Do they have little parachutes on them by any chance? Uh, we don't know. Not yet. Okay. I was just wondering. Yeah. You never know. Well, the thing that I see, too, like you were talking about uh, in one conversation that we had about how you have um, the capacity to, to paint or do corrosion control on things like bridges and enormous ships, like battleships and things like that. So it would take a long time for one drone to handle it and paint an entire ship i imagine so 
do you have like an army of little drones out there working at the same time or how does that work no no actually these are rather large so they're one meter by one meter so they're not the small drones that most people think of when they consider a dji phantom for example mm -hmm. um and they're working at at high pressure so our, our autonomous proof of concept drone is working at 3300 psi and it's applying 1.6 gallons of paint per minute um so what we could do is theoretically with the math, we've been able to calculate that two of our systems would be able to, to basically coat a, a large cruise ship or a large Navy destroyer or aircraft carrier in a day or two versus the several weeks that it takes now. That's amazing. A day or two? That seems really fast. That's I'm thinking great. of the size of a cruise ship. I just, wow, that's impressive. I would think yeah, it would need at least 10 or 12 going at the it, same time. Yeah, it's super exciting. So when you, you paint the ships, we actually, this is in our future development roadmap. So we've done some studies for this, but we haven't actually done it ourselves. Um, the, the, the actual painting at the, they use the 6,600 PSI and they're applying, I think it's 3.5 gallons per minute. Um, but you think of an aerial robotic system, it starts in the top left corner goes straight across as far as it can to the to the right comes down a little bit and comes from the right back to the left so other than um scaffolding which they use now and or cranes with um you know um lift baskets on them uh, which you have to you know paint and then come down to the ground mm -hmm. travel over a little bit lift them back up paint some more come down to the ground travel over a bit and lift up some more you're not feathering the paint together. So when you when you have two sections of paint where you're applying the paint at one time, it's called feathering. But with a robotic system, you just start and you go all the way across the ship and then come back all the way uh, in the other direction. So the efficiencies are astronomically huge. That's super impressive. So can you do things for corrosion control as well, like bridges and have you tried on bridges? We have not. Uh, we're iterating towards the more complicated use cases, but right now we're doing the uh, the simple use cases like um, um, large ships, um, where they're more or less a flat, uh, long, big structure. That's but smart. In, in for for corrosion control, there's a, a an entire industry for non-destructive testing, which is where you check the wall thickness of um, metal for like a, a ship or in um, a chemical manufacturing facility or somewhere or an above ground storage tank or even an elevated water tank and so you have to make sure that the material inside these structures is not corroding the metal of the container and so periodically you take measurements from the outside to make sure that the corrosion is not such that you're going to have a catastrophic failure, for example. Tank farms, et cetera. Yeah, yeah and we, we have a, a large value add there because, um, again, these are places that are dangerous. Um, you have to put a person with a, uh, you know, a rope rappelling down to access mm -hmm. some of these in the cases of bridges or storage tanks. You. You bring in a crane or a, uh, a lift where a person goes up to take these measurements. And the efficiency that an aerial robotic system brings uh, is just creates a huge value add. I, I can imagine. And it, this is something we never knew. Personally, I never knew when we started this um, journey or odyssey. Now, can they fly day and night? Will they fly 24-7? Theoretically, yes. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, just like drones don't need oxygen so you could put them in locations that are dangerous to humans mm -hmm. you know these robotic systems also don't need um, light other than the light that we can carry on board and because we have an excess of power we can um, you know have some lights on there if need be well you need LEDs to be cool that that's really what it is <laughs> yeah so some yeah. Uh, some of the um, things we have on there for the sensors most of them don't require light, but we are doing some work um, that requires our, our visual odometry system. Mm. In those cases, we, we would need light and or if we're doing anything that requires a visual assessment. And, and what we do is 
something that a person most times can't do because if you're piloting a robotic system from the ground and you're 100 feet or 35 meters away with your robot you really can't tell reliably how close you are to a structure so if you're trying to go in and touch that structure to take one of these um, you know non-destructive test measurements it's very difficult but mm -hmm having the software and the sensors do it autonomously and automatically is the way to go because one it's scalable you don't have to have a trained uh, pilot to do it and and two it's repeatable and you know you push the button on the computer and each time it carries out the same operation the same way you know bob there's nothing we love to hear more about than innovative okay. solutions like this and things that bring technology to the forefront in uses that nobody ever thought of before i think it's just absolutely wonderful uh to see stuff like that, and we're just about at the end of our time. You did have a video. Did you want us to show it? Oh, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Shall we show the video we have? Oh, good. I'm glad we're showing this. The higher you build, the farther you reach, the bigger you dream, the greater your maintenance challenge. Inspecting, cleaning, and coating in high and remote locations is expensive, slow, and dangerous. Aerial drones work well at heights, but they are not designed for repetitive tasks. Industrial the robots safely plain, perform dangerous repetitive tasks for extended periods, but they can't fly. Until now, the Apelix Aerial Robotics Platform combines the precision, reliability, and continuous performance of a robot with the flight capabilities of a drone for safe and cost-effective maintenance and testing in dangerous and hard-to-reach places with no cranes, scaffolding, or rope work. Apelix is an early-stage company and the leader in aerial robotics. It is the only company with the proven ability to measure the thickness of steel on a 300-foot flare stack or clean and paint a wind turbine 260 feet off the ground. Our Apelix designed aerial robots serve as industrial tools capable of all day continuous work via shore power. The easy to use Apelix aerial platform can be deployed by engineers in the field with minimal training and adapted to a variety of uses including cleaning, coating, and non-destructive contact tests performed at heights and in confined spaces. Tests are compliant with industry quality standards and include eddy current, magnetic particle, liquid penetrant, radiographic, ultrasonic, and visual inspection. The Apelix platform is, above all, a safety tool. When there's dangerous work to be done, you need Apelix. Our software can be programmed to any industry quality standard, allowing the Apelix robot to perform multiple tests simultaneously. The intuitive Apelix dashboard allows inspectors to monitor data collection in real time and easily flag trouble spots. We constantly record geospatial, environmental, and job data via IoT and store at our data center. Higher, farther, bigger, better. Now robots can fly. And so will your maintenance and testing with custom solutions featuring Apelix. That's great. Very impressive. Oh, and it's super fun too. I mean, to have the opportunity to do something that is, you know, able to potentially save lives, you know, to take mm -hmm. people and workers out of risk and harm's way is intrinsically satisfying and grat and, and just to, you know, I, I I live a life of gratitude because of this. Yeah, it's really it's really cool. I do, do have the it is. Uh, and, and I think that what's nice is to see how it shows, well, this part is completed, and, and then you can go on to the next, and it's just seamless. Well, and one of the other really interesting things is coming from a computer science background or a, uh, you know, I made the comment earlier that these are flying computers and they're data-gathering mm -hmm. machines. Um, we now have big data because we're gathering all this information. So things that were done intuitively by the operators in the past are now done, you know, we're bringing science to the job and we're bringing the, uh, you know, the big data to the job so that future analysis can look back and, and, and go back to that data and see if there was a failure, 
what may have contributed to that because you may have a five-year cycle where you're testing the thickness of steel on an above ground storage tank for example but you not necessarily know that the same inspector is coming back each year and so some of that knowledge that's in their head that's not put into a robotic system or not put into a system for collecting it um, is is all collected now and, and additional data in an, in you know everything from environmental variables like the temperature or the barometric pressure to things like the uh, the gas sniffers that tell you how much oxygen or hydrogen are in the area while the work is being performed. Absolutely, and then you can use the historical and do um, analytics and deep learning and see, use it for designing future jobs as well. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, not only are you removing a worker from uh, a potentially dangerous situation and being able to do something faster, but because we're bringing this big data to it, we're also hopefully doing a better job because we collect this data. We have the ability to um, do predictive analysis or do future failure analysis that um, can be helpful, something that wouldn't have been possible under the previous way of doing things. Now, Bob, if anybody wants to get a hold of you to either start a project or find out more about you is the best thing to go to the website yeah yeah absolutely um, the, just the website uh, the email is info at appellix.com and the telephone number is there on the website as well and uh, there you know we, we encourage people to reach out and contact us that sounds great well Bob it's been an absolute pleasure having you on learning about your business and seeing what you're doing with it it's really really pretty mind-boggling and exciting so we wish you the best in this, and we hope uh, other people get a hold of you. And, and that I think, I think you're just touching the, the tip of that iceberg, it sounds like. So more fun to come. I absolutely it is very, I look forward to the next steps and see what you come out with next. Well, and a lot of this is not us. A lot of this is what other people come up with, because now we've developed, in some respect, a platform. So, mm -hmm. yes, we have a robotic arm with an indefector that can take measurements of paint thickness or the thickness of the coating of the wall uh, for a metallic wall but there are other things that can go on that end effector that we've never thought of that other people will come out with an idea and approach us for example somebody recently approached us with a device that you touch to concrete and it will measure the uh, level of corrosion on the rebar inside the Interesting. concrete. So once we have that platform and that st stable flight able to touch the structure all sorts of things can then be added. That's great. Well, anyway, Bob, appreciate you coming on. Don't take off before when we do run our outro. I want to ask you something at the end, um, but I think we're good. Thank you for coming on. We hope oh, you know, absolutely Thank much you. success in the future. And Susan, is always a pleasure to see you. And Thank we'll you. see if you're watching. Please get a hold of Bob and learn more about his product. Uh, we'll see you next time on Life Edge. Have a good one, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks again, Thank Bob. Thank you.